before we get into today's uh, topic, which I think is an interesting one, I want to share uh, quickly two things. Um, one is uh, I went to see the doctor on Friday. I've been dealing with a cough for several weeks now. Uh, I thought it might just be allergy related, but it seems more likely that it's uh, bronchitis. I'm on some medicine now that hopefully will uh, help me and hopefully I'll get through this recording uh, without uh, very much uh, distracting coughing. The other thing I want to mention is that I honestly appreciate it when people give me constructive feedback on these videos, including presentation and technical issues. And two different people separately uh, kind of indicated, uh, uh, one came out and, and said it, and the other kind of hinted that they like it when um, I include a video of me talking along with the slides. Um, so I'm going to try to do that more. Two reasons I don't always do that. One is I prepare these slides primarily and initially for use in the short service where I preach, which I'll be doing tomorrow. And, uh, and so I want the slide to fit that and to use the whole slide uh, for the material. And uh, there's no need to have any video of me because I'm standing in front of them. Um, so I have to redo the slides to make room for um, a little box with video of me in it. And that takes uh, a little bit of time and effort. Um, but also, I really hope that most of the time people are focusing on uh, what's on the slides, which a lot of the times is mostly Bible verses. But I understand that people like to connect with the person presenting the material. Uh, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. So I'll try to have these little video boxes more often, not necessarily through the whole talk. Sometimes there's more material on the screen, and then I'll take the video box off. Okay, so now let's get into our message, which is uh, saved by childbearing. <laughs> this is something that Paul says that's hard to understand. Uh, let's look at our verse. For, uh, let's look at our verse from... Uh, First Timothy. Here we go. First Timothy 2.15. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to understand what Paul meant when he wrote this and also help us to think about how it applies to our lives and also some applications that um, are very important even if it's not exactly what Paul was focusing on. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Peter wrote this about some things that Paul wrote. He wrote, Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. And a, a number of commentators speaking about 1 Timothy 2.15 wonder if Peter had this verse in mind. If he didn't have this verse in mind, this is probably still an example of something that Paul wrote that for many people has been hard to understand. What did Paul mean by this? Now, most of what Paul writes is not hard to understand. You can read it, and it's pretty straightforward. It means what it says. It says what it means. But Paul does write some, some things, and this is not the only example, that are more difficult to understand. Not everything in the Bible is easy to understand. The most basic truths actually are easy to understand, and the most important truths. But this is, this is a, a verse that, it's a little bit more difficult to understand. Now, the way I'm going to approach this is I plan to share with you four proposed meanings for this verse. Now, what is our goal? We want to know what did God, walking through Paul, 
intend to communicate to us. That's our, that's our goal whenever we're reading the Bible. We want to know what God is, is, is truly meant and what God is saying through the Bible. Now, because God wrote the Bible through human authors, we can also ask this question. What did Paul mean? If we could ask him, what would he say? Now, there are some sections of the Bible, like future prophecies and visions and dreams, where the human author of the Bible probably did not fully understand the meaning of what they themselves wrote. Uh, but most of the Bible, the human author did understand the meaning. Maybe not all of the applications for everyone, but the basic meaning of what they themselves wrote, they understood it. God was not bypassing their mind and their understanding. God was working through their mind and their understanding. So I think if, if Paul was with us, we could ask him, <coughs> what did you mean by this? And that he would probably explain it to us. But he's not here with us, so we're going to have to uh, try to study it ourselves. Now, I'm going to share one possible meaning which is definitely wrong. Then I will share three meanings, which are each true. They each say something true, but I'm not sure which of these three was intended. So all three are something which is true, but it doesn't mean that Paul was intending to communicate all three of these other options. Um, and I hope this will make sense as we go. So here's the uh, verse again. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, just uh, thinking about salvation the way that we normally do and the way that the Bible most often speaks about salvation, it's understandable that some people, a thought comes into their mind and they're like, uh, is Paul saying when a woman has a baby, her sins are forgiven and she gains the gift of eternal life? That's what the Bible often means by salvation, our sins being forgiven and getting the gift of eternal life. And I want to say, and I think that most Christians immediately know this at some level, there is no way that this is the intended meaning. And why do I say that there, there is no way that this is the intended meaning? This interpretation contradicts the clear, repeated, consistent teaching in the rest of the Bible that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus. The rest of the Bible does not teach that the way a woman gets her sins forgiven is by having babies. Uh, and, 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 and because we believe that the whole Bible is God's word, we believe that it's all harmonious. It may teach truths that are uh, it teaches different things in different places, but those different things are never contradictory. The Bible always agrees with itself. So we interpret the Bible with the Bible. Uh, this is one of the most important principles for understanding the Bible. So let's look at some verses that clearly tell us how we are saved in that, in that having babies has nothing to do with how we are saved. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This verse says nothing about having a baby or not having a baby. Uh, the way that we get saved is by believing in Jesus. Acts 16.31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul didn't say that. Well, the women in your household, if they have babies, they'll be saved. <laughs> That's ideal. It's totally not in the Bible. And um, we get saved by believing in Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's, it is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. Now, if women could have their sins forgiven by having babies... That would be something that they could do themselves. I, I mean, I understand that there has to be a man involved, and um, I understand that sometimes women want to get pregnant and they can't, and other times they don't intend to, but they do. But generally speaking, if women could get saved by having babies, that would be something they could do themselves. But we cannot save ourselves. We are saved by having our faith 
in Jesus. It is something that God does uh, for us when we have faith in him. And then there's many other verses, but one more that we'll look at, Romans <coughs> ten nine. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no requirement for a woman to have a baby in order to be saved. Just like men, we all get saved the same way by confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. And there are many other verses that teach that we are saved by faith. And there are no verses that teach that women get saved in terms of the meaning of salvation, the most basic meaning of having our sins forgiven, <coughs> um, that they get saved by having babies. Uh, many evangelical statements of faith, probably pretty much all of them, say that based on the Bible, say based on the Bible, that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus our Lord. It, none of them say anything about women being saved by having babies. Now I say evangelical statements of faith because um, some other church traditions have statements of faith that have a lot of stuff in them that I don't agree with. But if you look at evangelical statements of faith, while they may disagree on some secondary issues, on the, on the most fundamental issues, including how we get saved, they all agree on this, and, and none, none of them. Uh, and this is based on many, many people reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and coming to this conclusion. None of them think that women get saved by having uh, babies. Now, I want to stop here for a minute because we, we were just discussing what may be the most important truth for people in all of history in the whole universe, and that's how we, get, how we can have eternal salvation. In one of the verses we looked at was Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And God just put it on my heart to stop and, and, and talk about this for a minute. This isn't just a, an intellectual issue. This is the most important thing in your life and in the life of every single person you know. Do, do you need to do this? Uh, do you know someone who needs to do this? Most of you listening are probably already Christians, but there might be someone listening that you, you haven't done this or you're not sure. Have you ever confessed that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? And if so, I want to urge you to put your faith in Jesus today so that you can be saved, your sins can be forgiven, and you can have the gift of eternal life. You can do this by praying a simple prayer to God. I'm going to pray a short prayer. You don't have to use my exact words. It's just an example, but you could follow this. And you could use a prayer like this to lead others also in believing in Jesus. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you. I do not deserve to live forever in your wonderful eternal kingdom. Thank you that Jesus died for my sins. I, I want Jesus to be my Lord. With your help, I want to follow and live for Jesus. I trust in him to save me, in you to save me. I know I cannot save myself. Thank you for your promise of salvation. Thank you that after Jesus died for my sins, he rose from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Now, aside from you needing to do this, you might know somebody who needs to do this. And I, I encourage you to um, uh, encourage others to accept Jesus. Um, and, and, and you don't have to be uh, someone whose main ministry is evangelism to ask someone if, 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 if they're saved, if they've accepted Jesus as their Lord, and to encourage them to do that. If the person has a lot of questions, you can try to answer them, but if you're not sure how to, you can bring them uh, to short, invite them to short with you. 
uh, or, or help them to meet with a Christian who's good at answering those kind of questions. Um, it's the most important thing in the world. Uh, so I pray, Heavenly Father, bring to mind people who we need to uh, ask and encourage to accept Jesus as their Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you have done this, or somebody you know does this, uh, what, what, what comes next? Um, let's see, just a second. Here we go. Um, well, you should tell someone. And one great way to do this is to, um, some churches have an invitation where you can go forward. You don't have to do it that way, but I think it's a great way to do it. And then you should be baptized because uh, Jesus taught and the Bible teaches that after people are saved, they should be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then you should attend a good church. I recommend choosing a Protestant. Uh, there's lots of different types of Protestant churches. A Protestant, theologically conservative, evangelical uh, church. Um, I'm, I'm a pastor in the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, I think Southern Baptist churches are almost all in that category of theologically conservative and evangelical. They should all be. Um, it doesn't mean that every Southern Baptist church is a great church. But there's other denominations that are also good theologically conservative evangelical churches. And there you can grow, grow in Christ. You can worship God. You can start to serve God. Okay. Um, so let's get back to... Uh, our topic, we can be confident that this interpretation is wrong. Paul did not mean that when a woman has a baby, her sins are forgiven and she gains the gift of eternal life. Yet, we believe that Paul was saying something true in this verse. Um, so the first proposed meaning is, is wrong. If someone thinks that's what Paul was saying, that's something that doesn't agree with the rest of the Bible, so we know that it's, it's wrong. Let's talk about the second possible meaning. <coughs> Paul was referring to God's promise to Eve, and this promise is fulfilled when Mary gives birth to Jesus. So here is the verse, yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, some people think that this verse is referring to Genesis 3.15, a promise that God gave. Um, actually, it, it, it's, it's not directly a promise. It's, it's something that God says, actually, when he's speaking to the serpent. Um, God says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, when God says you, he's speaking to the serpent, and uh, that, that's the devil. Either the devil was in the form of a serpent, or the devil was kind of like um, uh, speaking through the serpent or something. We don't know exactly how that worked. But he's speaking to the serpent, and, um, and he said that there's going to be hostility between her seed and the serpent seed. Now, broadly speaking, uh, all of humanity is descended from Eve, and the devil hates all people. So in a way, this applies to all people. It especially applies to God's people, to people who trust in and follow God. And the devil is especially making war against God's people. This is clear all throughout the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. But in this verse, it's especially focusing on one specific descendant of um, Eve. It says he, and he refers to Jesus. So obviously, Jesus was not one of Eve's direct children, but Jesus was a descendant, a great, 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 and many greats. Uh, grandson of Eve. And it says, He, speaking of Jesus, will strike your head. This is referring to the fact that Jesus, by dying on the cross and forgiving our sins, uh, will 
destroy the work of the devil, and this will eventually lead to the devil's complete and utter defeat and destruction. Um, so striking your head is, is a good way to symbolize completely and utterly defeating and destroying your opponent. But it also says, you, you, the devil, will strike his heel, meaning that the devil would cause Jesus to suffer in the process of this. And of course, Jesus suffers on the cross and die to the point of death, but then he is resurrected. So this is a uh, prophetic statement, the first prophetic statement, telling us how God was going to save us after we fell into sin. So how does this relate to 1 Timothy 2.15? So she, this is Eve, but here Eve is representing all women who have faith in God. She is saved by the by the childbearing. In, in, in Greek, it has the word that means the. Now, the word the is used differently in Greek than it is in English. So it doesn't sound as strange to say the childbearing. Um, but in this context, the, the childbearing doesn't have to mean it's referring to one specific child, descendant of Eve, but it could mean that. Uh, it's saved by the childbearing, referring to Eve's descendant, born to the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And um, now this isn't going to save all women. It will, it will save women if they continue in faith. Now, you can't continue in faith unless you first come to faith. So you have to come to faith in Jesus, just like all those other Bible verses we looked at said. And then when you come to faith in Jesus, if it's a true faith, that's going to put love in your life and in your heart uh, and holiness. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfectly holy without ever sinning again, but it means that you're going to be striving with the help of God to live a holy life and, 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 to, and to get rid of sin and gunk from your life with self-control, with fruit from the, the Holy Spirit. Now, there is support for this ideal in the preceding verse. And at this point, I am going to... Uh, get rid of uh, my little video box here so that we can use the whole screen for me to show you some things. Okay. Um, so we just shifted to full screen for the slides. And uh, Lord willing, in future videos, you'll get to see me uh, again. Um, so 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14 are talking about what happened in Genesis 2 and 3. For Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. So it makes sense that now uh, Paul wants to give some hope to women that even though Eve was the first woman, she was deceived by the devil, that women, just like men, just like men, can be saved by Jesus. So in the very next verse, he says, yet she... Uh, meaning Eve, will be saved through childbearing if they... Now, that could be referring to all women, and in fact, it also applies to men, but here Paul is specifically focusing on women. If they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, if this is what Paul was saying, it is definitely something true. I don't know for sure that this is what Paul intended to communicate, but if it was, it's something that agrees with the whole rest of the Bible. My, my feeling after studying this a fair bit and reading multiple commentaries on these forces with different views is that there's about a 25% chance that this is what Paul was intending to communicate. Now, if he was intending to communicate it, it's true. Even if he wasn't intending to communicate it, it's still true that, that God fulfills his promise given to Eve. Um, in that we are saved by a descendant of Eve, namely Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, now let's talk about the third and fourth possible meanings. The third and fourth possibilities both treat childbearing as a figure of speech, technically called synecdoche, where childbearing is used to represent all of the tasks related to bearing and raising children and running a household for the family to live in. So, uh, so synecdoche is a figure of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa. 
to hear some examples of synecdoche, um, asking for someone's hand in marriage. You don't want to just marry her hand. You want to marry the person, but the hand is symbol symbolically speaking of the whole person. Hungry mouths to feed. You're feeding the person, not just their mouth. <laughs> but um, again, this is a, a part representing the whole. Someone could say Putin has invaded Ukraine. It doesn't mean that Putin attacked Ukraine all by himself. It means that the Russian army that he, he leads and commands has invaded Ukraine. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it doesn't mean just bread. It means our basic daily needs, which would be food, bread, and other food that we need. And, uh, and, our, and I think it includes our other basic needs that God knows that we, that, that we need. Um, and then this one, I think, might be the most similar type of synecdoche um, to what pa I think Paul could be using in 1 Timothy 2.15, and probably is. If I, if I say I need to clean the dishes, this probably includes drying them and putting them away, even though literally cleaning them wouldn't include drying them and putting them away. But when, if I say that, I'm probably talking about that whole group of jobs and not just cleaning them. So here in 1 Timothy 2.15, here childbearing could stand for not only giving birth, it definitely includes that, but also to raising children and keeping a home for them to live in and all the work associated with it. And Paul had this kind of work in mind. We see this in 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10. No widow should be placed on the official support list until she is at least 60 years old, has been the wife of one husband, and is well known for good works. That is, if she has brought up children. And most of the time, that would mean that she gave birth to those children, although sometimes women raise the children of other people. If she has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. So I think Paul is using childbearing to represent all of these types of things. Um, Paul also talks about this in Titus, which he wrote near the end of his life, just like he wrote for Timothy in that same time period. Paul writes, in the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good, so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, which implies that they've had children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands so that God's message will not be slandered. So, so Paul doesn't think that all women have to just walk in the home. That's definitely not true. And there's examples in the New Testament of women who did walk outside the home. But many women do a lot of very important work for God in their home. And so Paul could be focusing on this. This does not mean that women cannot or should not work outside the home. It means that working in the home is a common and very valuable type of work, especially when there are children at home. Also, remember that before there were modern appliances, working in the home was very labor-intensive. And unless one was wealthy and had servants, it was definitely a full-time effort. Even today, it still takes a lot of work to keep a good home, and especially when you have young children, it's a lot of work. This was even more true in the past. Now, this also does not mean that only women who have babies can grow in Christ. It doesn't mean that. God has many other ways in which people grow in Christ other than having babies. So salvation does not always refer to initially being saved and having your sins forgiven. That's probably the way it's used most often in the Bible. But it can also refer to the whole lifelong process of growing in Christ once we are born again. So, for instance, in Philippians, Paul writes, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purposes. Now, Paul does not say work for your own salvation. He says work out your own salvation. Once we are saved, that should produce in us a desire to serve God and to become more like Jesus and to grow in Christ and to do good things that God wants us to do. Uh, Once we are born again, God calls us to often difficult tasks which may require suffering and sacrifice. He uses these to help us become more like Jesus, which is part of his plan of salvation for us. Now, a woman having children um, and then raising them to, uh, uh, to believe in Jesus as best as she can is one of those difficult tasks. So Paul is using this as an example, and it's an example that doesn't apply to every woman, but applies to many, many women. So he uses this as an example. Having children is one of the ways in which God teaches Christian women to become more and more like Jesus. So the first proposed meaning was wrong. The second one, it says something true, but I, I'm not confident that it's what Paul had in mind. This one also is definitely saying something true. I have no doubt that God uses the hard work and the love that goes into it and the sacrifice that women make to have babies and to raise their children and to keep a good home. That's not a calling for all women, but for the many women who do that, I have no doubt that God uses that in their lives for good, for the good of others, but also to help them become more and more like Jesus. And God uses other types of hard work and other types of duties for other Christian women. And, of course, he has other types of, obviously, men don't have babies, but he has other things that that we do that involve sacrifice and and sometimes suffering uh, that helps us to become more like Jesus. But is this specifically what Paul had in mind? Again, I say just my feeling is about 25% chance that this is specifically what Paul had in mind. But even if it's not, it's still a good truth to remember. Okay. (coughs) For the fourth and final possibility, we note that will be saved can also mean something like will be kept safe from. So most of the time it's talking about being saved in terms of having our sins forgiven, but it could mean being kept safe from something. Um, Paul could be saying that when women are busy doing the work that God has called them to do, and the example he gives is childbearing, they will be less likely to be deceived by the devil. And again, this this isn't going to apply to all women. For some women, there's other types of work that will help them not to be deceived by the devil. But this is a very common thing that God calls women to do, and God uses it for good in their lives. Now, this makes sense because in verse 14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. So Paul immediately explains that um, one way that women can make it less likely that they will be deceived by the devil is by doing the work that God has given them to do. You've heard the saying, idle hands are the workshop of the devil. Um, But when we're doing the work that God has called us to do, whatever that work is, and, 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 and Paul mentioned childbearing because it's special for women, and he's focusing on women in this part, um, but, but it doesn't mean that that's for the only work that women do. And, it, and, and, and women who don't have babies, he has other work that can do this. But she will be saved through childbearing. In other words, she will be kept safe from being deceived by the devil if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. In other words, if a woman doesn't even believe in Jesus, it still might be good for her to have a baby but it's not going to keep us safe from being deceived by the devil. It's the combination of doing the hard work and the sacrifice of having children and caring for them and raising them up um, while you believe in Jesus and you're showing the love of, of, of God and you're trying to live a good life. This will help protect you from the devil's uh, lies. Throughout, this gives strong support to this ideal. Throughout, first and 
2 Timothy, there is an emphasis on keeping God's people safe from the devil's snares and deceptions. At the beginning of 1 Tim Timothy, Paul says, Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some have deviated from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. You're less likely to deviate from the true faith in Jesus if, of course, you have to have a faith in Jesus, but also if you're busy doing the work he's given you to do. Later in chapter 3, Paul is talking about uh, elders. He says, furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. So Paul is worried about the possibility of Christians falling into a trap of the devil. And in chapter 4, Paul writes to Timothy, uh, Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for by doing this you will save both yourself and your heroes. Now, Timothy was already born again. He was already saved. His sins were already forgiven. But it will keep Timothy and, and other Christians safe from being deceived by the devil and falling into a trap of the devil. And in chapter 5, Paul writes, at the same, same time, they also learn. Now, this is the opposite of, 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 of being busy doing the work God has given you to do. And Paul is again talking about women. <coughs> he says that, and, and here he's not talking about all women, but just women who are not doing what they're supposed to do. At the same time, they also learn to be idle, going from house to house. They are not only idle, but are also gossips and busybodies saying things they shouldn't say. Therefore, I want younger women to marry, have children, manage their households, and give the adversary no opportunity to accuse us. For some have already turned away to follow Satan. Now, Paul isn't saying that every woman needs to get married, and he's not saying that every married woman needs to have children. He's saying that for many women, really for most women, this will help them to live for Jesus, and if they believe in Jesus, then doing the jobs that God wants them to do, whatever those jobs are, but for many, many women, that a big part of their job, especially when they're young, is going to be to have children and manage their households. This will help them not to be deceived by Satan. So, uh, what Paul might mean in 1 Timothy 2.15 is this. Having children is one of the activities that can keep Christian women from falling into traps of the devil. Now, that is definitely something true. Whether or not that's what Paul was trying to teach in 1 Timothy 2.15, I certainly believe it is true. I think this is the most likely meaning. I'm going to give it 49%. Now, you might notice that doesn't add up to 100%. It adds up to 99%. That's because I feel like there's a small chance that there's another meaning other than these four that Paul primarily had in mind. And some other meanings have been proposed they're not very widely uh, viewed positively today, but they're not impossible. Or maybe we just haven't exactly thought of the exact right meaning. Um, but I think of the four meanings, this one is the most likely. Now let's close with something very practical, namely some applications. <coughs> okay. We should thank God that Jesus was born to Mary and that through him we are saved from our sins. So we talked about this. I don't think that's the main thing Jesus was focusing on in 1 Timothy 2.15. But the Bible definitely teaches this in many other places. And we should say, thank you, God, for fulfilling that promise to Eve through Mary giving birth to Jesus and Jesus being our Savior. <coughs> we should all trust in Jesus for salvation and encourage others to do so. We talked about that earlier in the message. And then number three, women should do what God has called them to do. And this often includes being mothers and homemakers. Not for every woman, but for many, many women. It includes being mothers and homemakers so that they will grow in Christ and so that they will be kept safe from the snares of the devil. So now I hope that 1 Timothy 2.15 makes more sense to you. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I pray that you will use this video for good. Thank you for wonderful, godly Christian women and all of the different type of work you do through them, sharing the gospel, 
um, ministering to people in many, many ways, um, and having babies uh, and raising those children so that they uh, have a really good start in life and a really good chance to grow up believing in Jesus and having their own sins forgiven and living for you forever. Uh, protect all of us, including women, from the lies of the devil and help all of us to be busy doing the jobs you've given us to do, whatever those jobs are, uh, so that we're less likely to fall into the devil's traps. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And may God bless you.